really insightful, knowledgeable panels. Uh, we have another one coming up right now on the FDA, EU Commission, and Track and Trace, as well as COP10. All four of those subtopics could be panels in themselves. And we have three experts uh, joining me that have a lot of incredible knowledge and experience and are doing a lot of work on the legislative and regulatory fronts um, in multiple ways. They're colleagues of mine. Um, I serve as the head of government affairs and deputy executive director for the Premium Cigar Association and, um, you know, interested in discussing this. I'm going to bring everybody up uh, so that they can introduce themselves and also talk a little bit about what their organizations do um, and how they're involved in the policy landscape. So this is definitely a policy centric uh, panel, uh, but one that's very necessary. So uh, Paul, why don't we start with you, introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your organization. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua, for, for having me you know, today on, on your panel. So I'm Paul Varakas, I'm the Director General of the European Cigar Manufacturer Association, uh, acronym ECMA. ECMA is uh, the representative body of European cigar manufacturers. We represent, give or take, seventy percent of the cigars that are placed on the on the European market. And what we do, of course, is that we try to educate uh, EU decision makers about the specificities of our industry. Successfully or not, that's not me to say, but uh, that's what we do, and that's what we continue to do. Thanks, Paul. Well, uh, Mercedes. Hello, and first of all, many thanks for giving me the opportunity to join you today. My name is Mercedes Vasquez. I work for the International Tobacco Growers Association, ITGA. I'm the chief executive officer, and ITGA was uh, created 40 years ago by the six main exporting tobacco growing countries at the time. And since then, we have grown to more than 22 uh, associations around the world and ever since the creation of ITGA what we do basically is to advocate on behalf of tobacco growers around the world and uh, at these very challenging times it's um, of utmost importance to, to be like engaging uh, at regional and international level so later today I will be explaining a little bit more in detail what we do but for now, this is it. Thanks again. Thank you. And Patrick? Thanks, Josh. Uh, Patrick Rooney with Swisher International, uh, as well as the entire Swisher family of companies, including Drew Estate. Uh, you know, I work uh, primarily in federal legislative affairs as part of our external affairs and new product compliance department. So I'm primarily focused on either dealing with the United States Congress, the FDA as a regulator, and also helping to bring some of our newer products to market. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Paul, I'm going to direct the first question at you. You know, given recent developments, how do you see the regulatory landscape for cigars evolving in the European Union? No, thanks, Joshua, for that question. Uh, and, and I presume by uh, recent developments, you're referring to you know, recent U.S. developments, of course, uh, with, the, uh, with the meta ruling. And I think uh, I'll start with stressing on that point, because I think that's very important for the audience to understand um, the specificities between the U.S. and then the European legislative framework. Um, to put that specific development into context. And uh, first and foremost, you know, just to remind her, of course, that the uh, U.S. Tobacco Act gives the FDA immediate uh, regulatory authority when it comes to cigarette, trolley tobacco, and smokeless tobacco, right? And that means the FDA can uh, legislate directly on those products. And then you have an extension of that authority for you know, jurisdiction for other tobacco products that they consider to have population levels effect on the public or, of course, on youth initiation. Uh, and I'm sorry if that's boring, but I think, you know, it's just important to take into that consideration that the meta ruling fits into that extension kind of, you know, grab of power from the FDA. And it's different because we will not be able to replicate, you know, similar kind of ruling in Europe um, due not because you know we're lazy, not because we don't know how to fight or etc. You know, in our side of the world, but simply because the EU regulatory framework is so different. 
Uh, here, the EU, let's call it the EU Tobacco Act, basically gives EU and national regulators immediate regulatory authorities on all tobacco products, including cigars. Um, and so that means that, you know, when you're talking about what's next in terms of regulation for cigars, um, it will mean that in the future, cigars will continue to be regulated. You know, we're not in a situation where we are going to lose the kind of scope of application of authorities. But we're very confident that the exemptions that we hardly won in Europe when it comes about, you know, exemption on, on flavors, the exempt on flavor bans, sorry, the exemption on combined health warnings, the admission, the exemptions on emission methods. We're confident that the specificities of our industry would continue to be recognized by regulators. And of course, that comes with, you know, I think Mercedes and Patrick said so, you know, whether we want to talk about advocacy or education. I think that's 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 key to do, and that will continue uh, to do as well. Absolutely, and it's been a good working relationship with you and, and the PCA in collaborating on comments that you know for the European Union for certain member um, you know countries, as well as kind of the sharing of information and resources. So whether it's the court cases or the uh, health research, that uh, is important that we keep that exchange going. Uh, Mercedes, I want to uh, shift a question to you. I know that ITGA has been doing a lot with the uh, co upcoming, upcoming COP10 conference and the World Health Organization. How does the decisions made by the World Health Organization, especially the, the, those that are going to be discussed at this conference, impact the international tobacco and cigar industries? And what measures are being taken to navigate that? Uh, I will start by citing the WHO FCTC onwards about the initial scope and preamble, uh, which it was to protect present and future generations from devastating health, social, environmental, and economic consequences of tobacco consumption and exposure to tobacco smoke by providing a framework for tobacco control measures to be implemented by the parties in order to reduce continually and substantially the prevalence of tobacco use and exposure to tobacco smoke. And then to give you a little intro about the nature and applicability of the FCTC, it is legally binding to signatory parties. It is an international agreement and not a legislative act. It is not directly applicable at national level, normally requires further legislative action. And actually, there are uh, 192 parties and its impact, the entire value chain. And why it is important? So first, when the uh, WHO FCTC mentions tobacco industry, what it means is tobacco manufacturers, wholesale distributors, and importers of tobacco products. When it mentions tobacco products, what it means is products entirely or partly made of tobacco leaf as raw materials, which are manufactured to be used for smoking, sucking, chewing, or snuffing. And again, why is it relevant? Why should we pay attention to what it is being discussed at, at the conference of the parties? Because, because it refers um, to tobacco products, but may have major implications throughout the entire value chain, and therefore for tobacco growing countries, and the resulting legislation may regulate to an extent of preventing export of certain types of tobacco. And in a radical approach scenario, which we have seen in the past, it can significantly limit, maybe end tobacco production entirely. So uh, basically, uh, this is the main scope we are looking at. Uh, at the next uh, conference of the of the parties, the issues that we can expect to be discussed are measures beyond those required by the convention, accountability of the tobacco industry, which might include leaf production, tobacco advertising, depiction of tobacco in entertaining media, promotion of the WHO FCTC through human rights. This is a very important point, and this is one of the measures that goes beyond the, those required by the convention. And work guidelines on tobacco products regulation that may include nicotine reduction, and then the environmental matters related to the climate change. Uh, 
And we need to understand that the WHO is trying to put tobacco uh, as the main enemy against uh, the sustainable development goals. And they are very advanced on this uh, objective. Thank you for that. I know that uh, PCA and my colleague Ryan were working hard to address some of the issues that we expect at the COP10 conference, and we're partnering with the Taxpayers Protection Alliance uh, in their Good Cop, Bad Cop conference, where we'll be uh, addressing in, in rapid real-time response some of the misinformation coming out of that conference. And uh, we will be on location in Panama, coincidentally hosting a cigar reception at the beginning of the, uh, the conference. So um, we, we definitely are, are going to counterpunch um, what, what's going on with that. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to shift over to a question with you about some of the regulations. I know that um, there was a sigh of relief collectively from the industry with the Mated decision, as, as Paul mentioned, in, in, in the United States. But there's a lot of other challenges that we all work on, local, state, federal. Um, but in particular, there's some proposed rules that are extremely harmful for retailers, manufacturers alike. Um, I wondered if you could speak on some of the things related to what the FDA is, is currently doing. Sure. So uh, first of all, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. You know, I'll, I'll lead off with the TPMPs, the tobacco product manufacturing practices that are going to present rather significant challenges for us as a manufacturer. And it's going to require incredibly costly changes to implement without providing much of a public health benefit. I mean, we, we all know that the cigar, the usage patterns on cigars are completely different compared to other tobacco categories. So, you know, what are they hoping to accomplish here? Further, you know, some of the details in that in those TPMP proposals, like track and trace or a lab like environment, uh, very difficult to implement on a hand rolled or handmade product. Uh, again, with with minimal or marginal uh, benefit to the to the consumer. And then further, you know, with foreign manufacturers presently not registering with the FDA and the FDA not having inspection authority in a foreign entity, yet they want these rules to apply to them. You know, and of course, it's heavily debated whether or not they have the legal authority to do that. Uh, that's going to be rather interesting to see. And that's part of our comments that we submitted. And and we'll see as as that goes forward. And further, another issue, you know, you spoke about the meta decision that we were thrilled to see. And that presents prevents uh, you know, existing regulation on a large portion of our Drew Estate products. But, you know, at La Gran Fabrica Drew Estate in Nicaragua, you know, uh, products that that are not uh, now protected by the meta definition are made in the same factory. And so we're going to have a factory that is both subject to TPMPs in parts of it on certain products, but not on others. And that's just going to be very difficult from an applicability standpoint. Uh, further, I'd be remiss to not mention uh, the product standard for flavored cigars uh, that's going to impact a large number of manufacturers and, and I'm sure a, a similar number of retailers. You know, it's it's going to be rather significant and have disproportionate impact upon countries such as, you know, the DR, Nicaragua, Honduras. I mean, fragile countries, uh, very important to the economic uh, output of those entities, large portion of their exports. So we'll see what comes to there. You know, that is currently sitting at the Office of Management and Budget at the White House for review. Uh, just got transmitted over there Friday. And, you know, they have up to 90 days to act further. Uh, we'll see how long how long they take. But as everyone knows, that that rule uh, includes a definition of, of flavored cigars that is that is incredibly broad and designed to impact both you know machine made and handmade products like like we make. Uh, and like I said on earlier rules, it just lacks scientific justification. Uh, when we see youth usage rates are under one percent on cigars, whether they're you know flavored or not. Uh, so why are we destroying lives or sorry, livelihoods and businesses with with no positive benefit, with incredible uh, negative impact towards federal and state budgets? Uh, it's you know, these are these are legal products consumed by legal adult consumers. The FDA's own data shows that. Uh, so why are we opening up this opportunity for greater trade of illicit products and and other negative things. So what I would say though there is this prevents us an incredible opportunity to educate lawmakers uh, as to the process. You know, obviously there's a lot going on in the US Congress right now, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people have been following, but you know, this is an important issue that impacts 
hundreds of thousands of people and their livelihoods. And, and we're going to do everything we can to defend the industry. Absolutely. And, you know, it's one of those areas where the FDA has been continually sloppy with some of the recent proposed rules. I mean, you look at the tobacco manufacturing product standards, you have the SBA basically saying that their economic analysis that the FDA conducted was junk. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, th another agency within the U.S. government filing a comment questioning the research and, um, you know, data that was presented by another agency. And then, you know, I think it's uh, I would be remiss without saying it on the characterizing flavored standard. You know, it's still on the OMB OIRA site that this has no international impact. That is, uh, you know, blatantly false. So um, I think that collectively we all have our homework to do um, on that to make sure that the uh, correct information is out there. Um, I know that you mentioned track and trace in your comments. Uh, I want to kick this question to Paul. I know he has a, a lot of experience with that in the European Union. Can you, in plain language, explain track and trace and what you're seeing um, in, in the European Union with that? I recently got back from a, a trip to Italy and toured the Toscano factory, and they kind of walked me through the track and trace, and I, I think it's a mind-boggling development. No, absolutely. Well, uh, I could have an entire panel, I think, on track and trace. So, you know, like you just summarizing in one, uh, I'll, I'll really try my best and apologize to the audience. Um, well, the, the, the track and trace, as its name suggests, you know, means that uh, authorities should be able to track and trace on a kind of real time live moment every single pack of tobacco products across the supply chain. And the idea was that uh, it's a tool meant especially to combat uh, EDC trade of cigarettes, right? Where we know that a big, big part of the uh, cigarettes that you find on the markets are actually uh, legally manufactured cigarettes somewhere in the world uh, that are placed illegally on the market. And so they thought that, hey, let's make sure that we can count and uh, trace and track every single pack of cigarettes out of every factory in the world. That's the idea. But of course, uh, and I think, you know, Mercedes and Patrick touched upon that, uh, is that when it comes to tobacco control uh, regulation, uh, whether we're talking about the WHO, the FDA, or even the European Commission, of course, they're not necessarily, you know, like open to nuances when it comes to tobacco control. And they've extended that uh, track and trace system to all tobacco products. And that includes, of course, cigars. But uh, as Patrick mentioned, and I think that, you know, meta rulings and plenty of other, you know, studies, nasum, doesn't matter, you know, like Eurobarometers and, you know, countless of studies shows that the production of cigars is unique and so different than cigarettes, then obviously a system designed to combat EDC trading cigarettes is simply not fit for purpose. So you talk about, you know, Toscano indeed, uh, and whether or not we're talking about machine-made cigars or handmade cigars, it's just insane uh, that you should be able to, you know, to, to really accommodate even for a machine-made process. Because I think a lot of people don't fully understand what machine-made cigars means. It also means that, you know, in Europe, that you cover the, the leaf, the wrappers mechanically, but you still do it like this. So the speed of production is way, way, way slower than for cigarettes. And usually the packaging, and that's the case for handmade cigars, you roll your cigars, but you package it somewhere else. But if you apply the, a, a method of production like cigarettes, you are forced to basically reorganize your entire you know, production uh, facilities. And for some of, of my members in Europe, the costs are just enormous. Like, and we know that we know exactly the, you know, in terms of consequence, there's only one consequence. And I know that sometimes we are being described as using that argument to be too easily, but here that would be the case is that manufacturers will simply close door because the costs are too much to bear. So what you will see in the coming years, especially in Europe, is that we'll find a consolidation of the market that the smaller members will have to sell because they can't afford such, you know, an expensive system. Thank you for that, Paul. I know that 
all of us operate in, you know, a highly regulated industry, different, you know, bodies of government, um, oftentimes demon, demonized by the opposition. And, you know, in, in certain countries, I know, Paul, in the European Union, lobbying, you know, with the tobacco industry is illegal. You can't actually meet and describe things. Given all of those challenges, um, how can we collaborate with information, data, research, and really assert a, the narrative um, with our stakeholders about the positive economic impact um, and what the actual research and scientific evidence um, says about the products. Um, Mercedes, I'll, I'll kick that question over to you, but I, I think I kind of want to go around, Patrick, Paul, sure. I, all of you could address that, but Mercedes, I'll start with you. Information and raising awareness about the importance and the economic impact, social and economic impact of tobacco growing in the countries where it's grown. Um, I mean, we need to own our arguments. We cannot let somebody else uh, uh, tell us our own history. Uh, and this is a very key priority of ITEA overall strategy. So um, we've been engaging with the entire to tobacco supply chain and governments around the world for the last 40 years. And among the key advocacy activities, we have we run regional and global meetings and conferences uh, every year and promote environment, uh, an environment of inclusiveness, which is what the WHO FCTC doesn't do, and uh, a proactive engagement. Uh, the information we bring to these meetings covers the latest tobacco market dynamics, and we are. I mean, here the the. Uh, the ITGA represents tobacco growers, and tobacco growers are at the very base of the tobacco supply chain. So we need to educate them. We need to bring this information, latest information. So as I was saying in these conferences and meetings, we cover the dynamics of the tobacco market, the regulatory environment, and the assessment. And of course, the awareness raising about the realities of tobacco growing, uh, mainly to kind of react the unbalanced regulation coming our way. And moreover, we have run global campaigns, uh, mainly since the entry into force of the WHO FCTC. And uh, all through this year, we have commissioned several studies which are still the base of research about tobacco growing in many cases. And, uh, of course, we take the time and the resources to go and visit main tobacco growing countries every year. And uh, we make this round of stakeholder meetings, including governments. Global governments are also to be uh, educated about tobacco growing uh, because um, at the extent of the WHO FCTC, we need to understand that tobacco growers are not allowed to represent themselves. This is they are not uh, allowed to be part of this discussion. So our governments are out there in these discussions and they need to understand the importance of uh, what the discussions are about and the impact that it might have in the, the, the tobacco growers livelihood, the, the communities, the regions, the economies. And uh, so this is what we are trying to do and we've been doing it for, for the last 40 years. And uh, also uh, building up the capacity of the growers associations around the world so they can add as their own advocates at national level. And um, just to give you an example of these overall activities, our next global meeting will take place in Tanzania in October 29th. And understanding the importance of this debate, the Minister of Agriculture of Tanzania is hosting this meeting. So this is just to say that all the information, but engagement coordination within the supply chain and with governments implied and uh, uh, the educational process not to stop ever uh, because this is an ongoing thing and uh, we see the challenges just skyrocketing and uh, besides the, le the le legislation or regulatory environment, we have all the other inherent problems or issues uh, linked to tobacco production. 
environmental, social uh, viability of tobacco growing. And I think only together we can really address these issues. Thank you for that. Patrick? Sure. I, I would just say, you know, for better or worse, there's very, there are very few times when government comes up with a new idea and that, that can be applied, you know, all over the world. And at times, you know, things that we see coming to impact the U.S. market have been tried in, in international markets. So, for instance, it's a place where PCA has been heavily engaged, and I'd love to compliment the work you do on, you know, the concept of generational tobacco bans, right? So we've seen that implemented in, in other countries. And, you know, while it may sound crazy in the United States and something that's not gone anywhere, there were two th or three states last earlier this year that proposed the concept of a generational tobacco ban. And there's one town in Massachusetts that's already enacted one. Now, of course, it's being challenged legally because there's some issues there with the United States Constitution. But, you know, it's, you know, while the, the word lobbyist often gets used as a pejorative, I, I think that it's important to represent that who or recognize who that lobbyist represents. And, and Josh, in your case, the, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people whose livelihoods are tied to this industry, and then the millions of illegal adult consumers that bring a passion to this and, and love their, their premium hand-rolled cigars. Um, so that's where I would say just the consistent engagement and, and, you know, we're stronger together when we can, when we can align on issues and, you know, have great respect for the, for everything that everyone is doing to, to protect the rights of adults. Yeah. You know, it's one thing that we like to say in a lot of these, uh, sessions when we talk about international and then the collaboration, you know, bad policy or good policy has no borders. And like mm -hmm. we can learn from each other, share information because, um, you know, you mentioned a small town in Massachusetts and we, you know, first saw a lot of this, the generational smoking bans in New Zealand and Australia. Now the state of Massachusetts is considering this and that's an, a, a, you know, a new development in the last two weeks. So um, we have to be very nimble and ensure that we understand um, how effectively we can combat that. Uh, Paul, I'm going to give you the last word. I know we're wrapping up and uh, we're going to be talking about the Diplomatic Cigar Corps, which is another uh, good vehicle for international collaboration. Um, but Paul, um, kind of summarize, you know, the discussion that we've had here, um, looking at involvement and um, not only with, you know, the co individual companies and other associations, um, but how can we work to empower, you know, manufacturers, retailers, consumers um, to really get involved in some of this mundane regulatory stuff that's, you know, we all are interested in it, but it, it can be mundane at times. No, yeah, uh, no, no, thanks for that. Um, I, I think, you know, for, you know, the, the first and foremost is that, you know, it's our job as the experts that, that, that are here, you know, on this panel to, you know, simplify as much as possible what's happening. And I think that, you know, as easy as it sounds is that, you know, the, we have a very big responsibility of translating of what's happening in terms of regulation into simple message for, you know, consumers, but even retailers, you know, retailers don't deal with the same type of regulations that we are dealing when it comes about, you know, from a manufacturer perspective, of course. Um, so I would say, what, what can we do? You know, like, uh, you know, first, you know, you, you were mentioning about the illegal lobbying into the EU. You know, I think that, that the one critical thing to do is that not to be fooled by smoke and mirrors by uh, anti-tobacco control. Uh, you refer to, uh, well, Article 5.3, which is the supposed legal basis for that uh, illegal ban. Um, recently, the EU Court of Justice, which is the kind of EU Supreme Court, made it very clear that this Article 5.3, as Mercedes said, is not legally binding. And secondly, it doesn't amount to a ban. Is that we need to have restrictions, safeguards in place, but it doesn't amount to a ban. I should still be able to advocate on behalf of legal manufacturers of a legal product. Um, second, and I think that's the, even the most important, is that don't let anyone else speak on your behalf. And I think that's, you know, that's all as good as, you know, farmers, growers, you know, like we need association uh, like ATGA to, to really have this strong voice. I think we do need specific dedicated organization, you know, on cigars, you know, as well that can, you know, really bring to life this unique voice that we have. 
but also for consumers, you know, that consumers of, you know, cigars should really don't hesitate to, you know, write to decision makers, you know, decision makers, there is no thing. It's a myth to think, especially in Europe, that decision makers are inaccessible. It's our job to make it clear to them that, yes, you are fully entitled to write as an individual to a decision making body. Um, and lastly, you know, like how can we do? I think we need to continue the, the, the good collaboration that we've been putting in place. We need to continue having these online meetings, these you know physical meetings, just that we share best practices, uh, and you know the good, the bad, you know, and the ugly, uh, of course, in our industry. But to do that uh, and to continue to do so, absolutely, that collaboration is important. And as you you know correctly pointed out, a lot of the anti-tobacco groups have created these smoke and mirrors. And you know one of the things that we have made a priority here at PCA. And, and something that I'm proud of is not um, allowing that misinformation to go unchecked. I mean, our communication strategy, you've, you know, all of you have probably seen it. You know, we directly go after reports that these uh, groups, uh, you know, I think using the term fabricate is, is um, you know, the, the correct terminology. Um, but, you know, use hyperbole or exaggerations and, and, and some of that. So um, that's a commitment that we're making is that, you know, if we see something out there or members see something out there that um, doesn't really pass the muster of being factually correct, we are going to challenge it. We are going to look into um, where this is coming from. And I think that, you know, you look at whether it's the European Union or the uh, U.S. government or, you know, even the World Health Organization, a lot of this is coming from, you know, Bloomberg Philanthropies or other organizations um, that, you know, it's a cottage industry of, of lobbying and public affairs firms that their purpose, much like our purpose is to defend our, our members and our industry, their role is to um, ultimately prohibit the sale of, of tobacco, any, any tobacco. And, and, you know, for the longest time they, uh, stated that that wasn't their purpose, but I think we've seen that recently change. The goalposts are finally in full view. Uh, so the task is certainly, uh, challenging for all of us, but I enjoy our collaboration and, uh, working with all of you and your organizations. And I thank you for your time today and sharing your insights.